Welcome, everyone, to Genetic Alliance's webinar, The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act in Action. This is Sharon Terry. I'm President and CEO of Genetic Alliance, and really delighted to have all of you with us today. We have had a great deal of experience with GINA, as it's called for short, over the many years, both uh, in its uh, ascent to passage as well as since its passage. A uh, little tiny bit of background on Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act took Twelve and a half years to wend its way through Congress. Uh, we can talk about the sausage making of legislation if people are interested. More important, of course, is that it is now law and we want to hear today uh, about that law and how it affects us. Uh, this webinar is targeted to uh, individuals who work in disease advocacy organizations and certainly the public as well, uh, but we're looking uh, more specifically at what does it mean uh, to have uh, disease as well as um, to be at risk for disease with regard to this act. Our speakers today are Susanna Baruch and Jeremy Gruber. I'm not going to go into lengthy um, introductions for either of them. I'll let them give you what they feel is relevant. I'm going to suffice it to say that there really isn't um, any way I could say enough about what both of them did uh, to move this bill to passage. Uh, Susanna was at the Genetics and Public Policy Center for many of the years that we were working on this bill and was a great resource to both the Coalition for Genetic Fairness that was the main body of advocates moving the bill, as well as to the Congress and others in terms of um, being able to explain a variety of things since she is uh, both an attorney as well as somebody who's worked in the field of genetics for a long time. And Jeremy uh, has worked in employment issues for a very long time and again, was the same kind of resource for both the Congress and for the coalition, as well as the steering member of the coalition. Uh, we're also going to have with us today Allison Krakowski. Allison is a genetic counselor, and she will be available on the line as a resource for us to answer questions about um, any specific things with regard to genetics or disease. Um, Allison's assistant director of genetics resources and services here at Genetic Alliance. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Susanna. Thank you very much. Um, this is a pleasure to be here today to join you all, and I hope that we'll be able to have some good question and answer kind of discussion um, as soon as the presentations are finished. Um, I'm going to talk primarily today about um, a, a, about the first part of, G of GINA, the Title I that deals with health insurance. And um, what I want to tell you first is that today, while I work generally as an independent consultant, um, some of my work continues at Johns Hopkins for the Genetics and Public Policy Center, and today I'm sort of wearing that hat. Uh, so I hope that um, any questions that come up you can share today, and if not, at the very end, I'm going to give you an email address where I can be reached after today if you have particular questions that you think of. So just by way of sort of 10,000-foot background, um, probably no one on this call needs to hear this, but I want to sort of remind us all and, and start us off in our discussion with a reminder of the incredible potential that genomic and genetic information have um, and to sort of think about the fact that it is, it is that potential and the desire of Congress and uh, researchers and geneticists and advocates to enable people to take advantage of the potential, um, the, the many uses of genomic information, both now and in the future, um, include the use of it to help diagnose disease, to predict future risk of disease, to help people make decision making, uh, to, to help people make decisions in the reproductive context. Um, to think about both uh, drug response and therapy response in the case of, of diseases and conditions. Um, and the need that we have all seen for people's individual concerns about their genetic information being used against them to be addressed in order for this kind of potential to be realized. So in terms of the... Um, motivation for Congress to finally, after 12 and a half years, get the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act passed, um, fighting people's fear of the use of their genetic information in a discriminatory way um, was first and foremost to help individuals 
uh, feel like they could pursue genetic testing to help research and help researchers um, reassure people that their genetic information wouldn't be used against them. Um, but Gina was not sort of the first foray into this area, and in some ways I think Gina was the big, great idea whose time had absolutely come. There were already, uh, when Gina was passed, some indications that we needed to clarify other rights that were sort of emerging, um, civil rights protections in employment through the ADA and in, in the context of health insurance, which is where I'm going to spend most of my time today, uh, previous laws, state laws, um, laws like HIPAA that provided some protection, but didn't really get the job done of reassuring people about their concerns in, in this area. So in a nutshell, what Gina does in the context of health insurance is say that all health insurers, group and individual, may not use a person's genetic information in setting eligibility or premium or contribution amounts in health insurance. So you can't be rated up, you can't be denied health insurance because of your genetic information. And at the same time, Gina set out to prohibit health insurers from collecting people's genetic information, um, either by requesting or requiring that the person undergo a genetic test or by asking for the results of that test. Um, as Jeremy will talk about um, in much greater detail, there are similar prohibitions on the employment side. And of course, these, these uh, legal protections work in tandem, in part because so many of us get our health insurance through our employment. Um, there's protections in place on both sides, and these were sort of viewed as the most critical aspects of, of genetic uh, discrimination protection, was to address people's concerns in health insurance and employment. So genetic information is de defined very specifically in the legislation. Um, so a person's genetic test um, would make up their genetic information, and a genetic test would be a test that assesses their genes, their mutations, the chromosomal changes. But in addition to your own genetic test results, uh, family history, including the, the occurrence of a disease or a disorder in one of your family members, a family member's own genetic test, um, or the fact that you or a family member have participated in genetic testing or counseling or education or any research related. All of this information can, cannot be used against you. It is all protected uh, under GINA. And obviously, there are some common genetic tests that, that may be sort of obviously part of GINA, uh, GINA's protection. Um, test for cancer risk um, is one that is probably most often talked about. Uh, tumor profiling, Huntington disease mutation, um, and carrier screening that takes place in the context typically of reproduction. Uh, reproductive decision making, either before or during pregnancy. Uh, Gina also very specifically names some kinds of tests or information that are not considered genetic information and that are not protected under the law. So your sex or your age, the results of routine uh, blood tests, cholesterol tests, um, the analysis of infectious agents, even if they include uh, DNA analysis, all of these are not protected. Um, and, and the issue that is probably the biggest and the one that I think I will probably repeat myself three or four times in this presentation, the one to keep in mind that is not protected by GINA is information about a disease that has already manifested. And manifested in this case means a disease where there are signs and symptoms of the disease um, and it, usually um, with a diagnosis uh, in place um, from from an expert or a, or a doctor who's sort of qualified to, to diagnose the person. Um, and the, the legislation says specifically that in, the, in thinking about whether there are signs and symptoms, a genetic test result in and of itself, by itself, isn't a sign or a symptom. There, there has to be something beyond that. But I think this is a pretty critical piece of what GINA does not do. Um, because essentially, GINA is aimed at the genetic information that we have that is um, uh, not about our current health status. Um, current health status is a very broad term, but it, would, it basically means any conditions or diseases or signs or symptoms that are, are occurring currently. And GINA doesn't protect against discrimination on the basis of current health status. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other laws, including perhaps most obviously 
the, the law passes part of the national uh, health insurance reform that does provide people some protection from losing or being denied health insurance because of their current health status, because of pre-existing conditions. But GINA is not the law that does that. Um, GINA does also does not protect information about an existing disease simply because it is genetic. So sometimes people think that would be kind of an exception to the exception. Uh, that in, in a case where your current condition is genetic, um, the fact of it being genetic doesn't mean that it gets any protection under GINA. Uh, the disease is diagnosed and manifest, whether it has an inherited or genetic component is not relevant. Um, and then third, and this is also something that can be confusing, um, there are some state laws in this area, but GINA does not protect your genetic information from being used by life insurers, um, disability insurance, or long-term care insurers. And just one more piece of what GINA doesn't do, there are some health systems, uh, and I think often um, providers see patients who get their health insurance through these health systems, the military, Veterans Administration, the Indian Health Service, or, um, and I see this particularly in the Washington area, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. GINA doesn't apply to these systems. That doesn't mean that people in these systems have no protections because all of these uh, systems have their own policies that are um, pretty similar and comparable to GINA. Um, and as Jeremy will say, will tell you as well, employers that have fewer than 15 employees are covered by the employment aspects of GINA. But to spend another few minutes on this issue of GINA and the health insurance protection, GINA doesn't prohibit an insurer from doing what insurers do, which is medical underwriting, based on a current health status, even if that uh, current health status is the, the individual is affected by a genetic disease or condition. GINA also does not mandate that the insurer pay for any particular medical tests or treatments. So a genetic test isn't necessarily covered just because GINA exists. Um, any preventive care, any early treatment that are indicated by a genetic test, even if it makes medical sense, um, the, the medical necessity has to be shown. GINA itself does not mandate that any insurer pay for that kind of care. Um, and I, I guess I just want to reiterate that the new health insurance reform law does provide some protection in terms of health insurance coverage for folks who are who have been uninsured, who have been unable to obtain health insurance because of pre-existing conditions. So some individuals not helped by GINA will be helped by that law. Health insurers also under GINA cannot, cannot request or require that an individual take a test, and they can't insist on necessarily insist, insist on obtaining the results of the test. I'm going to talk in a minute about some examples where this can come up. Um, what, what's important, I think, to remember is that a treating healthcare provider, so an individual's own doctor, may of course continue to recommend or request or uh, talk to an individual or a family member about undergoing a genetic test. Uh, nothing in GINA prohibits or should even inhibit a provider from doing that. And in addition, um, treating healthcare professionals should also be continuing to take family histories. While GINA is trying to prevent the flow of information to, uh, to the health insurer who's making the decisions about the health insurance, the actual treating healthcare professional should not be um, affected in this case. And it also, sort of the flip side is that uh, GINA shouldn't discourage taking a family history or recommending genetic testing or discussing genetic testing, and it should also not mean that providers are encouraging any unnecessary or superfluous genetic testing either. And so just to spend a moment on an issue that I think is sometimes confusing in terms of what GINA can and cannot do. I think it's fair to say that GINA, when passed, aimed to address two problems. One was to, um, in, to make sure that the use of genetic information to discriminate was stopped. But as part of sort of prevention of the use, um, GINA has some aspects that help try to keep information private. But there does remain a difference between 
the knowing the information, whether the insurer actually obtains the information and the actual use. And so it's, I think, helpful to keep in mind that there are circumstances under which a health insurer may lawfully and legitimately obtain a person's genetic information, but when it comes right down to it, they are prohibited from using that information for uh, rating or for discriminating. And so to give you an example um, or a couple of examples, an insurer can still insist that a requested medical uh, treatment or care um, is medically necessary. And in insisting on proof of medical necessity, sometimes family history or genetic information may appropriately be requested. So, for example, if a patient in her 30s wants to obtain um, payment for uh, early mammography or other kinds of preventive care for breast cancer or ovarian cancer, the insurer may legitimately require her to show a family history or the results of a BRCA um, breast cancer and ovarian cancer risk test without it being a violation of GINA. Now, under GINA, um, the insurer has to request the minimal information that is minimum information that is necessary to make the decision. Um, so in a circumstance like this, it may be that having a family history would be enough for this patient. Um, the insurer couldn't insist, for example, that she undergo BRCA testing if she doesn't want to do so. As another example of where uh, an insurer may not request or require information and where we're trying to sort of stem the flow of the information, um, there's a rule under GINA that when, uh, as often happens, medical records are requested um, for a legitimate legal reason, um, such as someone's changing their health insurance plan or an employer makes a request for free medical records because you've made a request for accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, GINA says that genetic information need not and should not be sent. Um, the request is not for genetic information. It is it is simply, in these circumstances, a request for current health status information. Um, now, it's easy to say that. Anyone who has dealt with a uh, medical office probably can um, attest to the fact that it's hard to imagine a medical office sorting through somebody's complete medical records. So one thing that may happen in these circumstances is that the whole medical record goes off, and if there's some reference to family history or genetic information in there, um, it may be included. Uh, so here's an example where the law says we're going to stem the flow. The reality may be that the insurer ends up um, with some of the information, but the point or the, the sort of critical um, step here is that they may not use that information if they do get it. Um, and I do want to say that I think in the future, in a world where electronic medical records become the norm, there may be opportunities for us to work with uh, medical record systems to help figure out ways to redact genetic information when this, this kind of request goes through. So uh, what I just want to say finally is that in cases where an individual believes there has been a violation of GINA, the health insurance provisions are enforced and penalties imposed um, by the Department of Labor and the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, depending on the kind of health insurance that the person has. So these would be places to start with um, in cases of a violation. Um, and so finally, as promised, I do just want to give this uh, general email address for any questions that pop up after today. I hope we'll have an opportunity in a few minutes um, to, to talk about some of the questions that the law raises. But if there are other questions, I'd be happy to entertain them after today as well. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. That was really terrific and a great introduction to uh, the topic, Suzanne, and we will have plenty of time for questions, as you said. Uh, we're now going to have Jeremy talk about Title II, and I neglected to mention in the beginning for those who are not immersed in GINA, uh, that there are two titles to GINA. One is insurance, which Susanna just covered, and the second is employment, which Jeremy is about to cover. This made the passage of the bill uh, very challenging since it had many people who are interested in it from many sides, uh, unlike some other bills that are simpler and have uh, just one issue. So, Jeremy, would you please uh, present for us on the second title? Sure. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you for having me uh, uh, talk to you today about uh, GINA and Title II. Uh, 
Sharon and Suzanne and I worked on this for many, many years, and uh, I don't think that we can ever stop talking about Gina. So we always look about for opportunities to get it out of our system. Um, and uh, we have a, 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 if there's any questions about any of the information that I uh, talk about today, please feel free uh, to ask questions or to contact uh, me uh, by email or otherwise uh, through our website, which is councilforresponsiblegenetics.org where we also have a lot of information uh, about GINA, uh, genetic privacy discrimination, including our, our Consumer's Guide to Genetic Privacy, so I encourage everyone uh, who wants uh, additional information uh, to look there. And with regards to Title II of GINA, which is the employment section, um, this was really a, an initial challenge uh, when we be began working on GINA. The original versions of GINA only dealt with health insurance. Uh, and the uh, first challenge that we had was to uh, to get uh, employment added. Uh, and the reason why employment wasn't initially added uh, was because there was a lot of belief at the time that the Americans with Disabilities Act already covered uh, employment because there is an arm of the Americans with Disabilities Act that talks to uh, uh, having someone where they are perceived as having a disability. Um, and uh, through a combination of, uh, of an exploration of the ADA, and many of the court decisions that followed, it became rather clear um, that uh, that the ADA was insufficient um, in covering this area. And uh, and after a few years, uh, the employment section uh, was added to the bill and then, of course, enacted into law. Uh, it's also important to point out, uh, as Susanna did, and I'll talk about this near the end of my presentation, but that many uh, states uh, were passing uh, genetic non-discrimination laws leading up to the passage of GINA in both health insurance and employment. And, uh, and it was the perceived need for a common standard um, that, uh, that also helped propel GINA forward. One of the other reasons that GINA, of course, was propelled forward was because of the growth of genetic information uh, and the access uh, to genetic information uh, that uh, entities, let's say, that health insurers and employers uh, had. Um, and uh, of course, with the ability to uh, the first the, to identify individuals, you have the ability, which necessarily predates the ability to use it for research and to develop uh, treatments. You have that information available to identify and use to discriminate. So it's very important uh, that the employment section of GINA uh, was included to ensure uh, that employers did not have access uh, to genetic information or use it uh, for corresponding discrimination. So what is genetic information? I know Susanna really already covered this, so I'll just go through very quickly. But uh, a person's genetic test, the genetic test of a person's family members, and the occurrence of a disease or disorder in a family member, otherwise known as family history. What is not genetic information? Uh, standard uh, areas such as sex or age, routine tests such as cholesterol tests and analysis of infectious agents. So what does GINA do? GINA does two things. GINA prohibits employment discrimination based on the genetic information of an employee. Um, and by in describing employers' GINA and throughout, really, Title II of GINA, it mirrors uh, other civil rights laws. Uh, so it applies not only to traditional employers, but to employment agencies, labor organizations, joint labor management committees, um, and any entity that, uh, that controls uh, the employment process. Discrimination uh, is defined as including uh, failure or refuse to hire, termination, any type of the terms and conditions of employment. Um, so any time that uh, genetic information is used to make an adverse employment decision of any kind, uh, it is prohibited by GINA. GINA also makes it an unlawful employment practice for an employer to request, require, or purchase genetic information with respect to an employee or family member of an employee. And that's a very important section, particularly in Title II, because uh, employment discrimination uh, beyond GINA, but, but throughout uh, employment law generally, uh, is very difficult to prove. Uh, employers are not required und under law to give a reason for why they make an adverse employment decision uh, with an employee. Employers have control of all uh, the information uh, generally as to why a decision was made. Um, so until a pattern of practice uh, tends to develop where it becomes 
uh, somewhat obvious to an outside observer, it's very difficult to prove discrimination. So it's, it's very important to ensure that uh, employers weren't obtaining uh, employment information in the first place. And it, it, it's important to, to mention that uh, the definition uh, uh, is request, require, or purchase. It's not obtained. Uh, so uh, there are uh, legal uh, areas where an employer can acquire genetic information, which I'll talk to uh, in a moment. There are exceptions to the prohibition on the acquisition of genetic information. Uh, the first is uh, inadvertent request. Uh, that's oftentimes referred to as the water cooler exception. And uh, an example being where an employer would uh, an approach an employee and ask them how they were doing or how they were feeling. Um, and they were to divulge the fact uh, that they uh, uh, just saw a family member uh, in the hospital uh, who had breast cancer, for example. Um, any type of uh, spontaneous uh, exclamation that might include genetic information uh, is prohibited. That doesn't mean um, that uh, uh, employers uh, aren't prohibited uh, from acquiring genetic information during the course of this type of, a, uh, of an exchange. For example, if an employer were to start asking leading questions uh, where they know or should know that genetic information might be offered. Uh, th that, those types of exchanges are prohibited by GINA. So the exceptions to GINA, both the inadvertent request and the others, are meant uh, to be read rather, relatively um, uh, in a relatively fine line. Uh, the second being health or genetic services. Um, these are oftentimes in the form of wellness programs. Uh, but it's important to note um, that uh, offering up your own genetic information cannot be used as a precondition to joining a wellness program. So uh, if an employee chooses um, to offer uh, their employer uh, information, uh, family history, for example, is part uh, of their participation in the wellness program, um, that is allowed under GINA, although there are conditions for keeping that information separate from the employee record. Um, but uh, it is, cannot be a precondition. Uh, thirdly, an exception is made for monitoring of the biological effects of toxic substances. Uh, these are very rare uh, exceptions where an employee might be working in a hazardous area. Um, it is voluntary, meaning that an employer cannot require an employee to, uh, uh, to have a genetic test uh, for this reason, but an employer can request and an employee can choose to do so. And then there's some other um, more, more traditional exceptions, federal or state FMLA compliance, uh, records that are commercially and publicly available, uh, and law enforcement. And I just want to note for commercially and publicly available records, that includes um, internet uh, records, um, but they have to be uh, publicly available. So we're talking about things like stories in a newspaper um, or information on the internet uh, that everyone has access to. If it's password protected, um, if uh, some steps are required that limit the ability of certain individuals to access that information online or otherwise, uh, that information is protected. GINA also prohibits the disclosure of gene genetic information. So under the exceptions where an employer might acquire genetic information um, and, do, and does so, they are still required to keep it as part of the employed confidential medical record and are prohibited from disclosing it, with some very small exceptions, um, generally uh, at the request of, of the employee. Uh, health research, although that, that's anonymized health rate, uh, research, in response to a court order, again, FMLA compliance, or information of a manifested disease or disorder that poses imminent hazard of death or life-threatening illness. Uh, this last exception was one that was added um, without any real uh, examples that anyone could come up with, with uh, in order to show how this might actually happen. So it's really an exception um, that we don't think we'll, we'll ever really see the light of day. Uh, gene enforcement and remedies mirror other federal civil rights legislation, America, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, or, or any of the other uh, federal civil rights acts. So in order to uh, 
have a complaint under GINA, you must first go to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, file a complaint. The EEOC will evaluate that complaint um, and choose to either follow uh, through uh, that complaint on, uh, by themselves or much more likely uh, they will uh, give you what is called a right to sue letter. Um, and at that point, you're able to uh, secure private counsel and follow through that complaint uh, as well. The penalties um, for GINA, for a violation of GINA, mirror those of the Americans with Disabilities Act and other civil rights laws. So as Susanna mentioned, uh, an employer who has less than 15 employees uh, is not covered by Title II of GINA. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the costs that can be recovered um, are uh, depend upon the number of employees uh, that the employer has, and they gradually go up to a, a maximum of 300000 per violation. Uh, that does not include attorney's fees, which are also additionally recoverable. GINA, uh, and this is very important, GINA does not preempt state law. So there are 48 states that have uh, genetic discrimination and health insurance laws and 34 states that have genetic discrimination and employment laws. Almost all of those predate GINA. Uh, and as a result, uh, they are more limited in scope than GINA. Um, and they have uh, some uh, particularly limits on their definitions of genetic information. Many do not cover family history, for example. Uh, the one area, though, that uh, it should be noted is that Many of these state laws do not have the same damage limitations that GINA does. So if uh, you have an example of discrimination that does fit within the definition of some of these state laws, you may actually be able to recover more uh, money uh, by filing uh, under those state laws than, than just under GINA. But you are allowed to uh, file under both. Uh, there are, and I just want to make sure everyone knows this, there are other state laws beyond uh, health insurance and employment uh, discrimination. Uh, Sixteen states have uh, genetic non-discrimination in life insurance laws, another 16 in disability insurance, and 10 uh, in long-term care insurance. And as Susanna again noted, uh, GINA does not cover these forms of insurance. Finally, just last month, California passed uh, and the governor signed SB 559. Uh, it's the first um, uh, new post-GINA uh, law uh, to be passed, and it expands the basis upon which genetic discrimination is prohibited to include areas not only that GINA doesn't cover, but that no other state law addresses as well, including housing, education, public accommodations, life insurance, and workers' lending and elections. So Cal if you live in California, you have now some of the most comprehensive genetic non-discrimination laws in the world. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's important to note, and I think we mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, GINA really uh, was, a, was an important new law for many reasons, uh, but of course one of which was that it was really a forward-thinking law. We were already seeing genetic, non -discriminate, genetic discrimination uh, leading up to GINA, but this is really the first time that the Congress has passed a civil rights law in the history of the United States uh, before the type of discrimination prohibited really became part of the social fabric. Uh, so that's why uh, you know, we're very excited by GINA. Uh, we actually think that the, or at least I think that the use of GINA is only going to continue to grow as genomic science progresses uh, and, uh, and as uh, GINA stands to protect all of us from, from uh, important forms of genetic discrimination. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Fabulous. So uh, we have a couple of questions uh, that will kick off the conversation, and, and um, we have till 1 o'clock, so we have about 25 minutes. Um, we, we could go longer if we need to, so we'll just see how the conversation goes. So the first question, and actually I think it's going to need to have answers from Allison, Susanna, and Jeremy, um, and I'm going to, uh, it, it's a, a, a tiny complicated story, so I'm actually going to insert some um, uh, alias names in here so that we're not using people's real names. Uh, this comes in uh, written by one of our participants. So we have an individual, I'm going to call her Kathleen, and she receives health insurance benefits from her employer, which is typical for many of us, uh, which is a large private company. Um, Kathleen has a family history of Gaucher disease because her sister Debbie uh, 
has recently been diagnosed with Gaucher. Um, Kathleen herself has not been diagnosed with Gaucher, but she's still concerned, and she heard there's a genetic test for the disease, and so she goes to her health care provider for more information. Um, after discussing their options, Kathleen and her sister, Debbie, both decide to take a t the genetic test. Uh, when the results come back, Kathleen discovers that she and her sister both have two mutations for Gaucher disease. Uh, Debbie's health care insurance coverage increased costs when she was diagnosed, but Kathleen did not increase costs as a result of the test, and neither sister's employment status has changed. And the person has put forward a couple questions. First, why didn't her health insurance, Kathleen's health insurance costs increase even though the test was positive? And then second, why didn't Debbie's employment status change while her health insurance did? And then Kathleen later develops Gaucher disease like her sister. Would Gina still protect her from health insurers raising her premiums at that point? And that's a lot of questions and a complicated story. Um, I think this is often true for families living, especially with Mendelian disorders. So first I'm going to have, just because we have a wide range of people on the phone who understand different things, I'm going to first ask Allison if you could comment on, is there a genetic test for Gaucher disease? So is the story right? And then what's the deal with a genetic test? They write here that they have two mutations. Why do they need to make that point? And then, Suzanne, if, if, Suzanne, if you would speak about the insurance issues and, Jeremy, the employment issues for both of these women. Sure. So I can certainly go ahead and get started. So yes, there is a genetic test that is available for Gaucher disease. One of the things to keep in mind for genetics overall is that many different genetic conditions do have genetic tests available for them, but each genetic test may be different in terms of kind of its ability to detect um, a gene change or a mutation that we know is causative for a particular condition just because our understanding of the science for various genetic conditions is at different stages. The reason why the individual made the point about needing two mutations or having two mutations or a gene changes and then um, receiving a diagnosis of Gaucher disease is because Gaucher disease is inherited or passed on through families in what's known as an autosomal recessive manner. And what that means is, as you may remember from your high school biology class, um, almost everyone has 23 pairs of chromosomes. You get one copy of each chromosome pair from your mother, one copy of each chromosome pair from your father. And in an autosomal recessive condition, you have to have two non-working copies or two mutations in order to um, be at risk for developing that condition. If you are an individual who has two working copies of that particular gene, then you are not at risk to um, develop the condition. Or if you are an individual who has one working and one non-working copy of the uh, particular gene of interest, you're often called a carrier, meaning you carry one non-working copy of the gene. Oftentimes, carriers do not go on to develop symptoms of the particular condition, but they then are at risk of having um, children who may be affected with the condition if they were to have children with another individual who is either affected or a carrier. So that's all to say that in this particular instance of Gaucher disease, you would need to inherit two non-working copies of the gene in order to be affected because Gaucher disease is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. However, other genetic conditions are inherited in other manners, such as autosomal dominant or X-linked, and in those cases, the chances of being affected are, are different because of how many gene changes or mutations you need to have to be affected. Great, thank you. So, Susanna? Could you comment on the insurance issues for each of the sisters, particularly since we're sort of traversing a time span here where one is diagnosed, the other is not, and then both are diagnosed? Absolutely. And I think this raises a, a couple of really important issues, um, and so I will try to kind of address them as, as they're asked, But because I think it actually it, it's very helpful for all of us to think through this. Um, in terms of the question of, of uh, so, so – the sister, um, seeing her health care costs increase once she was diagnosed, um, this is, a, I think, uh, 
a phenomenon um, that we see that has nothing to do with Gina. Um, somebody who has uh, a disease or a condition that's going to result in the insurer paying for increased health care, the insurer sees it as a cost. Um, if subject to other laws, uh, state laws, health, national health insurance reform law, if they can, if they're sort of legally able to increase the amount that the person has to pay for their health care costs, the, the contribution that the individual makes, um, they're likely to, to do that. Um, and it, it uh, probably varies depending on whether Debbie, the sister, is in the individual healthcare market versus the group health market. Um, large employers with big group health plans, um, uh, there are more limitations even when there is an actual condition on the ability of the individual's costs to go up. Um, all of which is to say, I think, for the sister who has been diagnosed, we're, we're a little bit outside the realm of, of Gina, um, and the genetic the nature of the disease um, isn't necessarily relevant here. For Kathleen, um, the question is, once the test came back positive, why didn't her costs increase? Um, and so the... Uh, you know, the, the point of Gina is to say, simply because you are at risk for this disease developing, even if the risk is a virtual certainty, and I, and I don't know the circumstances with Gaucher's disease, um, that the simple fact of that information, if you don't have a diagnosis, if you don't have signs and symptoms of the disease, cannot be used um, uh, to discriminate against you in terms of the, the cost that, that you're incurring through your, um, through your uh, health insurance cost. You know, I will say that um, in a circumstance like this, even if legally the health insurer could raise the person's um, costs, let's say this, ha this all happened before uh, Gina was passed, um, that there would still be some protections in a group health plan. However, um, you know, a, a health insurer may see a genetic test and a, even a positive result as a cost saver in the sense that somebody uh, may be able to pursue preventive care early treatment, to, you know, that, that having a genetic test is something the insurer wants to encourage um, and pursuit of the preventive care would actually be uh, better than not knowing. So there's a lot of different ways you can imagine um, a health insurer, you know, the individuals within the health insurance company kind of thinking about this information, um, but the bottom line is there's no diagnosis here. Um, once a diagnosis occurs, then again, we're outside of the realm of Gina and Kathleen would be um, in a circumstance like her sister. Did I, did I get all of the pieces? I think you did, yeah. And Jeremy, comments on the employment issues? Sure. So, it, I mean, it, it, obviously it's a good thing that, uh, that there was no uh, adverse effect on, on the individual's employment. Uh, I think it's important to note that Gina uh, created some very fundamental changes in the way that employers uh, acquire medical information. Uh, prior to GINA under the Americans with Disabilities Act, an employer at any time could ask for medical information that they deemed job-related. And most importantly, um, at the time that a conditional offer of employment is made, meaning that they uh, make uh, an employer makes an employee an offer of employment based upon them fulfilling certain uh, tests, uh, at that point under the ADA, uh, an employer is allowed to ask for medical information, even if it isn't job-related. GINA changed all that. GINA um, prohibits the um, uh, uh, requesting or requiring genetic information, even if it is job-related. Um, and uh, it closes the loophole uh, for conditional offers of employment. So employers not only uh, can't ask um, for uh, uh, genetic information, um, uh, for, for if it's job related, they can't ask for genetic information uh, under the conditional offer of employment exception uh, at all. Uh, so while it's certainly not foolproof, what Gina really does is close some of the avenues where sort of patterns of acquiring genetic information might occur. So it makes it much more likely that employers who are going to improperly acquire genetic information and or use it we're going to do so on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh, so it's not, it, it's not uh, unusual that the employer didn't acquire that information. Employers are already required to keep 
um, personnel and medical records separate. Uh, they are not allowed to have uh, genetic or information um, even when uh, they're paying claims, when they're self-insured, even when they're a self-insured employer, they have to keep their, uh, uh, their the health insurance files and the uh, employment files separate. So uh, while it's certainly not impossible for an employer to get genetic information and use it, it's, it's much more less likely as a result of genetic. Great, thanks. Okay, now we have two questions uh, that relate to familial hypercholesterolemia. So again, maybe the same order in case there's any clarification uh, that needs to be done for the genetics and then Susanna and Jeremy. And I think, um, yeah, I think that that, that will work. Um, so the two questions, and I'm going to put them together because they're both about this same disease, uh, heterozygous and homozygous famil familial hypercholesterolemia is a lipid blood dis lipid disorder that presents with hyper-elevated cholesterol levels. A standard cholesterol test is a critical indicator in, uh, of this disease. As awareness of FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, increases, those standard tests could be used as a weapon for discrimination. That's the question. And then also, um, it could lead to deadly heart disease, and many with this genetic disorder die before they're diagnosed or suffer a heart attack as the first indicator of the genetic disorder would this apply to Jeremy's number five on his second to last screen? Um, and so, Jeremy, we'll give you a second to look at that while Allison, uh, if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about the condition, and then Susanna, if you could talk to us about um, could these standard tests that lots of people should receive, it sounds like, uh, could they be used as a weapon for discrimination? Just how familial hypercholesterolemia is different then Gaucher disease, the example I was talking about previously, is Gaucher disease is always inherited in that autosomal recessive manner, meaning that in order to be affected with the condition, an individual needs to have two non-working copies or two mutations in that gene. The difference with familial hypocholesterolemia is that it can be inherited, just as that first question stated, in a heterozygous manner, meaning that if an individual has one non-working copy of the gene, they may be affected, or in a homozygous manner, and that means they have to have two copies of that non-working gene to be affected. So the difference in FH in comparison to Gaucher disease is that FH has two different um, patterns of inheritance or ways that the condition can be passed on through families, and that is just a difference in how many mutations an individual has to have in order to be affected with it. Great. Susanna? Um, there's a way in which the answer to this is very straightforward, which is, um, unfortunately, the result of a standard cholesterol test that indicates cholesterol so far off the charts of, of sort of the, the usual range, even of elevated cholesterol in a sort of a clinical setting, is in itself not a genetic piece of information, it is in itself uh, evidence of a sign or a symptom or, or a diagnosis. So there may not be a formal diagnosis of the disease, but if somebody's genetic, excuse me, if somebody's cholesterol test result is so elevated um, that, that, that that fact in and of itself is a symptom of something, and it's just a question of putting a name to it, um, it it's not... Um, it, the test itself is a standard cholesterol test. It's not a genetic test. It may indicate that the underlying cause of the result of the test has a genetic basis, but that's different from saying that it's a genetic test. Um, and so in this case, Gina doesn't protect that information. Um, under sort of the, in the view of the health insurer, the cholesterol test result would be the same as the diagnosis. Great. And, uh, Jeremy, the slide that the individual meant is the one that's up on the screen right now, if you can see that. Number five, you had written information of a manifest right. disease. So, so uh, and I would just like to add to, to what uh, Susanna said, um, that any, any follow-up genetic test would be protected. Um, and I would also add that, of course, any discrimination is still prohibited, even under circumstances 
uh, where information is uh, legally acquired. Um, uh, specifically to, to number five, that's a very different scenario, and I, and, and I apologize if I wasn't clear. Uh, this is talking about uh, this exception to disclosure is talking about uh, a situation where an, there's an imminent hazard of death to the public. Um, so it really is sort of a you know, scenario that, that the individuals that offer this uh, exception uh, contemplated, although they couldn't offer an actual example in, in real life, uh, was a situation where somebody becomes uh, falls uh, ill in a, in a workplace, for example, and there's some reason to believe um, that knowing their genetic information uh, will somehow uh, you know, rapidly protect the public from some sort of uh, contagion. Um, and it really is that type of an example. It's, it's the contagion example since that movie, I guess, is out now. Um, we're not aware, uh, and I'm not sure if there ever will be an example where this is actually meritorious, um, but it certainly doesn't contemplate the example um, uh, that, that's been uh, offered on this call. Uh, this is a very different type of scenario. Sharon, may I just jump in to clarify something? Um, sure. Or at least yeah. I, think, I think I'm clarifying. It's possible that Jeremy and I use this differently, which would also be interesting, so we can talk about that. In the, in the case where there's a standard cholesterol test with a super elevated result, there may also be later a genetic test, as Jeremy said, that looks at the genetics that may have caused that results to occur. Um, does this person have this condition? Um, is it heterozygous or homozygous? And, or is there some other cause that, that has nothing to do with the person's genetics? Regardless of the genetic test, which I agree would be protected by GINA, the fact of the already very high cholesterol level in that individual doesn't fall under the information that GINA protects. So I don't want to say that information, you know, is free game for the insurer because there are these, there are other laws that would restrict um, its use under some circumstances, uh, as I talked about a little bit earlier. But it isn't, it isn't in itself genetic information. I, I agree. I agree with that. <laughs> Good. Oh, it would have been so much fun if you guys had. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. These are. Very complicated questions, and, and I have to thank our, our uh, attendees as well because the questions are, are coming in uh, in kind of a, a really nice nuance. We have a couple more questions, and, and I realize we, do, we did schedule this until 1.30, so we're, we have still plenty of time for questions. Um, I also um, want to call people's attention to the fact that we've put up on the screen a resource that you can go to uh, that's that's uh, at the URL GinaHelp.org, and it's a uh, resource that a number of us, including the folks on the phone, put together, um, funded uh, by the uh, Genetic and Public Policy Center with help from NICHPEG, which is the National Coalition for Health, Special Education, and Genetics, um, and the Coalition for uh, Genetic Fairness, and, and the resource is, is useful for answering some of these kinds of questions. But this is a great opportunity here because these are very nuanced questions. Um, my next question I have here from our participants is, uh, what about Fabre disease? So it's another genetic disorder. And is the story similar? So would we have the same story as we just heard for either of these other two diseases? And I'm going to, again, let um, Allison start because Fabre has a slightly different twist, which is good, um, and gives us a little bit different uh, challenge. And then if there's anything to add, Susanna and Jeremy, uh, you guys can jump in. Sure. So, sex explanations are getting more and more complicated as we go along. So, previously talked about autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, and now we have to throw into the next X link. So, I need to take you back to that biology class in high school once again. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. The first 22 pairs are the same in males and females. It's that 23rd pair that makes men and women different. Most females have two copies of an X chromosome, whereas a male will have uh, one X and a Y chromosome. And that is the pair that is of the most important when talking about an x linked condition, because that is on the X chromosome where the gene change or mutation that causes the condition, so in this case, that disease, occurs. 
So we have to kind of think through the inheritance or how that condition is passed on in a couple of different ways. So if we start with a female who is affected with Fabry disease, she may, she will have one copy of her X that has that particular gene that is working just as we would expect it to work. And she may have, she will have one copy of that gene that is not working as we would expect. And Fabre is a little unique even among X-linked conditions in that females who have a non-working copy of the gene on one of their X chromosomes may indeed experience some symptoms of the condition, whereas in other X-linked uh, conditions, um, females who are a carrier who have one working copy may not experience any symptoms at all. But we know that for females um, in Fabre, that if they have one non-working copy of the gene, they may be affected with symptoms. So when we think through for their children, what are their chances their children may be affected with Fabre disease? When we think about the sons that that woman may have, she has a 50% or a 1 in 2 chance that she will pass on the working copy of her X chromosome with that working gene onto her son, meaning that her son will be unaffected with Fabry disease. She has the same chance, so a 50% chance or a 1 in 2 chance of passing on that non-working copy of her X chromosome with that non-working copy of that Fabry gene onto her son. And if that is what is passed on to him, then he will be affected with Fabry disease. The same thing is true for uh, her daughter. She has a 50% chance of having a daughter who has that gene change or mutation and a 50% chance of having a daughter who does not have that gene change. And it's important for me to say here, too, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, that we don't control what genes and what chromosomes we pass on to our children, that it's all random chance, and it is you start at the same chances with each pregnancy that you have. So that explains a little bit about the chances of passing on um, the gene change that causes Fabry disease if the individual that is affected with the condition is a female. However, it's a bit different if the individual who is affected with Fabry is a male, because as I mentioned earlier, males typically have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So if a male affected with Fabry disease goes on to have children, all of his daughters are going to have that gene change because he only has that one X to pass along and they need to get an X from mom and an X from dad in, in order to end up with two X's in their sex chromosome pair. Now when we think about his son, the only way that a boy is going to inherit a Y chromosome is through his father. So if a uh, an affected male has Fabry disease and has has a son, that man is going to have passed on his Y chromosome. So an affected male with Fabry disease, none of his sons will be affected because they will have to inherit his Y chromosome from him. So I know that's a lot to do if I had you in the same room as me or if I had gotten this question in advance, I would have prepared a nice slide with trying to show this um, out in a diagram. I know different people learn differently. And if you have questions about genetics after today's webinar for these conditions that I've tried to explain verbally, I'd be more than happy to uh, direct you to where you can see some diagrams to really understand this information. And you can send those questions either to ask Terry, since Allison's last name is really long, we could give it to you. Um, Allison, you want to spell out your email? Sure. It is A-K-R-O-K-O-S as in Sam. KY as in yo yo at geneticalliance.org. Thanks. And if you forget that, you can either do S Terry or info. Uh, Jeremy or Susanna, any comments on uh, an X chromosome, X chromosomal condition like this? So I, I, I think that there's sort of two issues here that are maybe subtly different from the issues that have that we've already talked about. Um, because Fabre disease, um, from what you say, Allison, and I, I appreciate the, the briefing, um, there, there are individual, there are women who are 
essentially carriers that are affected to some extent. And and so even without knowing what those some that sort of you know moderate symptoms or some symptoms that you describe might look like, um, an individual who has those symptoms or a diagnosis of being a carrier, while in another circumstance the uh, genetic information that that woman is a carrier might be no questions that asked 100% covered and protected by Gina. In a circumstance where the woman herself has symptoms or, and or a diagnosis, um, we're sort of back in the, the world I keep, uh, unfortunately, keep saying isn't protected by Gina, uh, where once a condition has manifested itself, um, Gina doesn't protect that information. The fact of the genetic test, yes, that would still be um, protected. But from a health insurer's perspective, um, if the individual's mild symptoms would be a reason to think there's going to be need for additional health care costs, you might see a health insurer trying to uh, use that information to raise, to raise rates. Um, but again, there it is, sort of as a technical matter, the information about the signs or symptoms that the woman has exhibited rather than the genetic information um, itself. Um, so that's the first major thing. And then the only other thing I will mention is that while I, I think, you know, both Jeremy and I mentioned how uh, sex is not a genetic test, um, even in a case where there's an X-linked disease, the fact that the, the sex of the individual is part of the analysis um, doesn't, to, that in itself isn't relevant here. And that analysis that Susanna just gave uh, is, is applies equally uh, under the employment section as well. Great, thanks. There will be a quiz after this, everybody, since uh, <laughs> between the genetics and the law, this is quite complicated. And let me uh, actually, Sharon, if I can, let me just add one thing, because this is actually an important area that people should, should probably be aware of generally, and that is there really is a, a bit of a gap in terms of protections uh, between Gina, and at least in terms of employment, between Gina and the ADA. Uh, because uh, under the Americans, with Gina, as, as Susanna said, does not cover manifested conditions. Uh, but the ADA's definition of disability doesn't necessarily cover them either um, when you have uh, uh, manifested symptoms that don't necessarily rise to the level of being disabling. Uh, you are not, you are oftentimes not be, not covered, uh, under the ADA. And under those circumstances, you really do have a, a group of people left in the middle of these two laws without protection. And it's really an area of policy making, uh, that, uh, that we need to fix. So let's mount another 12 and a half year campaign. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, uh, another question that's a more technical one around Gina itself. The question is, does Gina sunset? So you can explain what sunset means and give us the answer. Um, the, a, a law that sunsets means that it has a time limit um, where unless Congress were to act, um, the law would cease to exist and cease to protect people. And the answer is no, Gina doesn't have a sunset provision. Great. Okay, that looks like we have covered all of the questions. Um, do either of you or Allison uh, have anything that you think we didn't cover in depth enough uh, for uh, both the archival purposes as well as for the folks on the phone? I, I mean, the only thing that I think it, uh, that I would draw people's attention to um, as they as they learn more about Gina is uh, to really understand some of the exceptions. Uh, under the uh, employment provision of Gina for acquisition of genetic information. Um, but more importantly, understand that those exceptions apply only to the acquisition of information. There are no exceptions uh, in Gina for uh, discrimination. Discrimination is pre prohibited uh, absolutely and completely. Okay. Oh, and actually another question. Um, so. This is all quite complicated, and can one rely on one's health care provider to understand this law to the depth that one needs, um, or should one be looking elsewhere for resources in addition to a health care provider? Well, one of the things that, uh, that has been uh, much to my dismay uh, since the passage of GINA is just how little um, people know about GINA. Um, many people, uh, in fact, the vast majority that have done uh, studies um, 
over the last year and the vast majority of the public uh, don't know that gene even exists. Uh, med many medical professionals don't know uh, or understand GINA, um, and, I, and I think we can uh, uh, assume that that applies equally uh, to many of the entities that might be uh, have to be in charge as well. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that your entity, that the entity is, is completely understanding. There have been training programs and, and such, but but I, I, I think this is certainly an area where people need to, to take charge of their own entity. And I think that especially as genetic tests and genetic information become relevant in um, sort of mainstream clinical care, uh, sort of outside the world of, of genetic diseases and, and geneticists and sort of uh, folks who are really steeped in genetics may be aware of GINA, but whether um, family physicians, internists, nurse practitioners, you know, people, the people who are sort of in a day-to-day -day way providing health care, genetic testing and genetic information and, and simple family history is um, going to continue to be incredibly important and increasingly so um, in predicting people's, uh, you know, future health and, and how to best manage it. So it is, I think it is a challenge for the future to continue to educate providers in that way. Also interesting, you know, I remember when we had the many, many discussions, particularly, I mean, you go through a webinar like this and you look at the definitions that are, have been used and it, it's hard to, uh, for probably for the public to appreciate that it, those definitions were hard fought and hard won on both uh, sides. We, while we were going through that, we knew that whole genome sequencing would be uh, a something in the future that would be available, but it wasn't like really just right there in front of us as the most critical piece. And now um, we know that in, you know, whatever the predictions range from two to five years, there will be whole genome sequencing for uh, individuals. And in lots of scenarios, there may be points of service newborn screening using either chips or, or um, whole genome sequencing for thousands of diseases. Uh, again, we don't know a lot of what the gene genome is revealing to us in those large sequencing projects, but as they become uh, more uh, prevalent and as people have that information more, what kinds of things do you see both um, where Gina benefits us as well as where maybe Gina falls short when we all are walking around with our whole genome available to us in terms of information? Well, Gina, I mean, bear in mind uh, that Gina is not a comprehensive genetic privacy law. We have no uh, com no federal comprehensive genetic privacy law in this country. So in terms of governing the flow of information in a variety of contexts that might be have been unforeseen just a short time ago, there really is no overarching world. GINA is, is really limited uh, to health insurance and employment. Uh, so and certainly in many of the other contexts where genetic information might be uh, acquired or used, uh, GINA uh, does not provide those protections. Uh, and, and so I think we're going to need uh, additional policy making to ensure that, uh, that the other areas become protected the way California recently did. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that the you know if there were if if one day there is um, the circumstance where we're all walking around with perfect information, um, both of our own genetic makeup and what it all means, because I think that's a huge question. That even if you know uh, every gene in your body. Uh, the information is pretty can, can be pretty um, uncertain about w what risk or benefit this mutation or that change may um, give to you. If we had perfect information, we might not see discrimination. We might see, you know, a, a rational system that was based on sort of the facts, and we would all recognize that we're all at risk for something um, that we all need. <clears throat> excuse me, that we all need uh, to be able to access appropriate care um, as well. You know, there's going to, even if that's a possibility someday, there's going to be a very long interim period where uh, individuals have information. They may or may not fully know what the information means. Um, insurers would want to have that information if they could. I mean, I think the classic example of where this gets to be difficult at a policy level would be something like um, the risk for Alzheimer's disease, and as we know more about the genetic contributors to that, you can imagine that long-term care insurers uh, 
would want that information about an individual who's applying for long-term care, if you're more likely to, to develop a real and intense need for long-term care. Um, at the same time, the individuals who might have that risk are the people who are going to most need long-term care. So how do you sort of regulate who has what information at what time um, in a process that, that has a huge impact on individuals' lives uh, in a way that makes sense for maintaining the insurance that people need as well. Um, so I don't pretend to have the answers there, but I but I certainly agree with you, Sharon, that as we know more, it's, it's only going to get more complicated. And another question, Justin. Uh, so you spoke, uh, particularly Jeremy, about state laws. Um, it's surprising uh, to some that depending on what state you live in, you have different protections, number one. And two, are there more states that are tend trending toward what California did, and that is revisiting this issue at this point and putting into place better protections? Well, I'd say it's actually, actually not unusual at all uh, for there to be different protections in different states. Uh, state law varies quite widely on many issues. Um, uh, in employment and and otherwise, um, oftentimes uh, Congress tends to step in and pass a federal law when enough states are passing laws uh, that uh, a common rule uh, is seen as necessary. And that was, as I mentioned, one of the reasons uh, that helped propel Gene along with the number of states that were passing uh, state laws. Um, but they are different, um, and they do offer different protections. Everyone has the protections of GINA in addition to their own state laws, um, but, but they do differ, and that's not necessarily uh, unusual. In terms of um, the, the new California law that was just passed, there are a couple other states um, that are looking at laws that are uh, generally in the, in the same vein, um, although with somewhat different protections, uh, including Massachusetts and Vermont. Um, the bill in Massachusetts has gone a little bit further. They had a hearing in March uh, of this year. Um, but those are the only two states um, that have uh, have moved uh, to in, in recently to, uh, to institute new bills. Um, a few states right after GINA was passed uh, introduced bills that never went anywhere. Um, but there's still a bit of lethargy, I think, uh, as a result of GINA being passed uh, to revisit the issue. Uh, and build upon that foundation. And, and there often is a lag time uh, after a new law is passed to, to revisit and build on those protections. Okay. And hang on one second. There's one more question coming in, but it's coming into my email. So um, I just have to get it to, into my email. Okay. So this individual thanks all of you for your expertise and, and the amount of time that you uh, devoted to answering these questions, and particularly the case examples. And the logistical questions that are follow-up, um, where would one find details on protect protections for non-covered employees, employer entities, for example, Veterans Affairs and Federal Employees Program? Uh, certainly GinaHelp.org, but are there other resources that you, uh, you know, with GinaHelp we were trying to be uh, general enough for the appetite of the general public. Are there uh, specific places you would send this person for Veterans Affairs and federal employees, et cetera? So there's the, as I mentioned earlier, there's our, our Consumer's Guide to Genetic Privacy. It's on CRG's uh, website, um, and, uh, and that uh, provides some, some description of these uh, of these areas, um, uh, but uh, but you may also find additional information on the EEOC's website um, and some of these other agencies as well. In terms of the veterans um, and military specifically, um, I, I am a co-author of a very obscure article <laughs> that we wrote on civilian and military genetics called Civilian and Military Genetics, Non-Discrimination Policy in a post gene World. Um, and it's on the Genetics and Public Policy Center website. So the web address is dnapolicy.org. Again, that's dnapolicy.org. If you go to the publications uh, 
page of that, you will find that um, it's from 2008, and it lays it out both in detail sort of where the military and veterans policies have come from and um, has some references to actual uh, laws, or I should say um, decisions that, have, that have, are the sources of the law. Um, and any additional questions, I'm happy to, to uh, get emails about as well. Great. Uh, where can we locate a list of the states which have protections extending to life, long-term care, and disability insurance? Again, if you go to the Consumer's Guide for Genetic Privacy, it has, it has those, uh, those lists there. Great. And would you give that URL again, Jeremy? Uh, it's on our homepage, um, Council for Responsible Genetics, uh, dot org, and, uh, the specific, uh, URL uh, for that, uh, let's see if I've, it's uh, Council for Responsible Genetics.org backslash genetic privacy. Great. And a uh, question here, could you please review again what an employer can ask and use if they're talking to someone with a genetic history who wants to participate in an employer wellness program? So under under the wellness exception, uh, an employer uh, and many wellness programs um, begin uh, with a, a rather lengthy questionnaire uh, that can include many questions, uh, uh, particularly regarding family history. Um, participation in the wellness program cannot be predicated upon filling that questionnaire out or for answering any other questions uh, that might divulge genetic information. So. You, an, an employer would have to make an accommodation uh, to an employee who wanted to participate in the wellness program and not provide that type of information. But to the degree that the employee sees benefit uh, just by providing that information to certain areas of the program um, that use that information uh, in a helpful way, um, that employer, employee can choose to do so. Um, if the employee does choose to do so, uh, the employer uh, must uh, maintain that information the same way they maintain other confidential medical information uh, separately from the employment file, and of course they're prohibited from using it to discriminate uh, regardless. And in the case when the company is smaller than 15 employees, it is, is it completely up to the employer whether to maintain job status, et cetera, upon a diagnosis? So Gina does not uh, cover employers with less than 15 employees, nor do, frankly, uh, most of our civil rights laws. Uh, there is an exception made for small employers, uh, and that's a general trend throughout uh, the American Disabilities Act, Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act, and others. Um, so, no, an employer um, uh, who uh, has less than 15 employees is not subject to any of the provisions of GINA that we've discussed on this call. Great. Okay. Um, then a couple of very specific questions that I think, again, will help us with uh, in, in a kind of case basis that might be uh, generalizable. So this person writes, I had a patient who was already diagnosed with breast cancer. She declined BRCA testing for the neophytes on the phone. That's a test related to the risk of breast cancer. She just declined the BRCA testing for fear that her disability insurance could be jeopardized by the results, even though her disability insurance is due to her having a non-cancer-related injury to her arm. I know that disability insurance is not protected, but I don't understand whether that could be the basis for discrimination of coverage related to an entirely separate medical condition and how exactly a disability insurer would find out this information in the first place. So I don't pretend to be a real expert on disability insurance, um, but I will take a crack at this question. Maybe Jeremy can chime in as well. The Maybe to answer the second part first, um, I think typically a disability insurer um, can and does require sort of basic information about a person's health upon application for the insurance and certainly upon um, uh, uh, request for um, the disability benefit being paid, um, that can sometimes include a medical record or a, a physician's note or something like that. And 
um, there is a risk in those circumstances, as we've discussed a little bit today, of genetic information that may or may not be at all relevant to the to the question at hand, kind of flowing with the medical record. So a note in a doctor's um, handwriting on a medical form or something like that m might get to the disability insurer. So they may they may have it. Um, whether they can use it or not, again, here is outside the the the, the realm of Gina. Um, and I what I what I don't know, although I suspect the answer is that uh, the, 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 I guess I don't know whether the disability insurance would be paid on the basis of a particular. Um, this, I think you have to show the reason that, that the disability actually has resulted in an inability to um, perform a task or, or or perform in a job. So I don't think it would be relevant to the BRCA test. Okay. I, I would add. I mean. As Suzanne said, a lot of that information is possible to come from the individuals themselves. And there are many, there are many areas uh, where insurance companies might acquire uh, genetic information separately, such as from a medical information bureau. Um, but there's, as I mentioned, there are states that have genetic non-discrimination uh, non disability uh, insurance laws. To the extent that um, the disability insurance is tied up with the individual's employment, uh, and the employer has uh, has some influence. Uh, there may be a, a Title II action uh, possible, but that's usually going to be in a, in a small number of circumstances. Okay, uh, and then this is a different patient. Um, so this pa this person writes, "I have a different patient who is the perfect example of a person." who does not have cancer but is at high risk, very high risk for breast and ovarian cancer. She also collects disability benefits owing to a psychiatric diagnosis. She is concerned that since her disability insurance is employer-based, that if she does BRCA testing, her disability and also her employer-provided health insurance could be jeopardized. Is this a legitimate concern? Well, it's a legitimate concern, but bear in mind that uh, that an employer uh, is mandated, uh, and this is this goes beyond Gina, is mandated to keep your medical and personnel files separate. Um, and uh, and in terms of uh, employers uh, who are that are involved in, in paying claims or, or such, uh, there are limitations on their ability to get genetic information. So I, I don't think that it would be certainly wouldn't be standard. Um, for this information um, uh, to be acquired. But there may be certainly be uh, cases where individuals might unknowingly uh, tell an employer uh, this type of information. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is an exception. There's an inadvertent acquisition exception. If the employee mentions that you know, they, they want to take the day off and the employer says, okay, and they say, oh, yeah, I'm getting this test, um, that, that is that, that is not covered by a GINA. That's a legal acquisition of information, even if they're prohibited from discriminating. And as I mentioned, you know, the reason why the acquisition, uh, uh, prohibitions on acquisition of genetic information in the employment section is so important is that it's almost impossible, uh, except under certain circumstances, to prove discrimination in, in the employment context. Um, so it's very important that individuals are aware of what GINA uh, protects and what it doesn't protect and, and make sure that they don't provide information uh, unwarily to their employer. Okay. And then a follow-up to the disability insurance questions, and we realize neither of you are experts in disability insurance, but in case either of you can answer this. Um, so if a person already has disability insurance in effect, uh, do they uh, continue to collect information on that individual? And so... For example, in the case of an individual afraid to take a test, subsequent test that has nothing to do with the disability, um, if they didn't inadvertently give that to the insurer, would the insurer actively be collecting more information in which that could be revealed? You know, my understanding is that there's a range of practices um, in terms of how disability insurers sort of operate, and some of it is subject to state law um, putting limits on what they can ask and when they can ask it. Um, so I don't have a I don't have a real answer. I'll defer to Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
Okay, I think, yes, I think we've covered all the questions. Uh, I want to thank the participants for really good questions. These were, were pretty in-depth, and I want to thank all three of you, uh, Jeremy, Susanna, and, and Allison, for giving us uh, such erudite answers. And, uh, again, this will be archived for those of you who are listening and found it difficult to follow all of this. Uh, we'll archive this, and it will be available uh, uh, through the Genetic Alliance website. Um, that they are, there is a comment here that we're very grateful for the experts and for uh, you guys' contributions. So, again, thanks for taking the time and for all that you shared with us. This is, uh, as Jeremy said at one point, very important information to get out. It's not out there enough. Uh, those of us who want it to be distributed are always thinking of uh, creative ways to get this information out, both to employers as well as to healthcare providers and the public in general. So uh, we appreciate being able to spread the word, so to speak. And again, thank you all for your contributions.